So we're going to talk about the objectives here, smoke management. We're going to talk about slop overs and spot fires. We're also going to talk a little bit about how to fight fire. Um, so what, if, what happens if you do have something get out on you? How are you going to fight it? And then we're going to go through some um, things that uh, oh, the national uh, NWCG um, folks and U.S. Forest Service have kind of come up with about things they've noticed on fires that uh, have not ended well. So again, smoke management is a really important part of our burn planning process. You know, we never want to smoke, you know, I, you know, I never personally want to put smoke on anybody's house or, you know, ruin anybody's day, but smoke is an unfortunate side effect, um, you know, of the fire process. Uh, so we want to make sure we minimize the amount of smoke that's entering, entering any populated areas or any kind of sensitive sites, you know, like hog barns or population centers, stuff like that. So we also want to mitigate these uh, visibility impacts, you know, especially along roadways. Um, one thing that happens quite a bit is people see smoke and fire and they immediately are drawn to it, uh, which is kind of ironic considering our fire suppression history, but uh, people are drawn to fire so they will chase it down for miles away. I mean, I've done it too. I see a plume of smoke and I'm like, Hmm, I wonder what's going on over there. So I want to go check it out. It's kind of natural or human uh, instinct to do that. Um, so along roadways, so typically we, that causes problems. And then we also want to avoid any kind of significant deterioration of air quality standards. Uh, we typically, you know, in Nebraska, that's pretty hard for us to do considering the amount of burning and the scale of burning that we do. Uh, but there are other parts of the country that, that this causes more problems for. So. And of course, looking out for power lines. So um, if you get really kind of thick black smoke and they kind of get up into some high voltage power lines, it can cause arcing. And uh, that, that carbon in that smoke um, basically makes that connection between the top and the bottom wire, creates an arc and can um, hurt people on the ground there. So we want to avoid putting smoke on there. I've actually never seen it happen. We put a lot of smoke on these power lines. Um, and haven't had it happen yet, but not saying that we don't want to be cautious of that in general though. Again, we want to make sure when we're planning our smoke management processes, uh, we want to make sure that we're paying attention to what's downwind and, and not just like, you know, half mile. We're talking like, okay, check five to 10 miles downwind uh, of where we're going to be. You know, roads, homes, businesses, uh, make sure you notify the neighbors that you're going to have smoke. Typically when we burn during the springtime, it's usually a really nice day out. And so you wanna remind your neighbors to shut their windows or take their clothes off the line. Uh, just be a good general neighbor if all possible there. Um, you know, do the best you can. Also consider your down drainage impact. So, you know, like I said, at nighttime, we get these nighttime inversions and these nighttime inversions, what happens is that the, basically the ceiling of the atmosphere uh, basically slams to the ground and, and holds smoke onto the ground. So if you're still burning at night, a lot of times that smoke can cause more problems than if it was during the day. So, you know, in this scenario, just looking at the map, you know, can you tell like what, you know, potential areas of impact you have? Well, you can see, you know, there's a whole row of houses along this north side. There's you know, one here, there's houses down here. You know, there's a road here looks like maybe a highway and some more houses up here. You know, if you look even further beyond just that, you know, you got hospital down to the southeast, but look how, you know, you got to consider also your burn impact. Like, you know, you're not really burning that much area here, so your smoke impact is going to be pretty minimal uh, to begin with. But if you were burning, you know, a section of ground here, you know, your impacts would be completely different than if you're burning, you know, five acres or something. So having a, pulling up an aerial map, a Google map, and kind of just slowly documenting or documenting those things, of uh, those impacts that your smoke potentially causes is good. Obviously, we want to try to pick a wind direction that kind of satisfied everybody, but obviously we can't satisfy everybody. Sometimes, you know, you know burning's got to get done. And so we got to pick a direction and, and deal with whatever is in the way. You know, if it's contacting all these neighbors by person, in person saying, 
we're burning today, you know, make sure all your windows are shut, all that stuff, uh, then that's what it takes to get it done. So we talked a little bit about mixing heights. Um, when we're looking up our weather forecast, again, we'd like to have at least a minimum of 1500 foot. Um, and then you can see kind of on this right side, this scenario where, you know, you got a stable atmosphere and you got low intensity fire, that smoke's gonna just hug the ground and not be good. Then you got like a low intensity, well mixed atmosphere. Your smoke lift, the smoke mixing is gonna be really good. Uh, that's all. That's pretty good. But then <clears throat> having a well or a moderate intensity with well mixed atmosphere is kind of what we're really shooting for. But then we have a high intensity, unable, unable, unstable atmosphere. You can see that smoke really gets up and out. But then that is also going to cause other problems downwind. Um, and also can create those, you know, we'll create their own fire weather and stuff like that. You'd have lots of fire rolls that day and stuff. With smoke management, again, uh, remember our wind speeds, you know, the higher our wind speed is, the more that smoke kind of hugs the ground. Um, and so, you know, burning with less wind speed will help get the smoke up in the air faster. Transport wind speed, you want to look at how fast that wind speed is, uh, you know, going in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And then also a fuel loading, you want to try to keep it under 10, 10 tons per acre. If you go above that, you're going to be creating a lot more smoke than the normal. Now, I'd say the normal fuel load in Nebraska is probably less than 10 tons per acre in general when we're burning grass. When we get into timber like cedar trees, it would be well over that. Okay, so when we're talking about smoke and roadways, we do have those signs in our trailers that we use, you know, a fire ahead sign. Uh, it's good to place those signs well before the actual burn so it gives people in traffic time to slow down and stop or turn around or whatever it may be. Sometimes you may actually need to assign crew members to stop traffic to, you know, or guide them through smoke. Um, you know, don't, if it's on a highway or interstate or something like that, you, know, you may need to contact the sheriff or state patrol, but you typically on gravel roads, um, it's not an issue. Uh, but it's always good to, especially have people working on the roadside, if you're lighting off of a road and burning out around telephone poles or something, um, you could post people there to, to make sure nobody runs over the crew, but then also people stay safe from the smoke. Here's a video, turn your lights on. There's a truck there, if you can barely see it. So that smoke can be fairly intense, especially on the fire line and near roadways. Here's run, uh, this is a road ditch here, right next to a crop field. So smoke is really important. We gotta, we gotta do everything we can to really kind of mitigate our smoke. Um, if we can't mitigate, you know, our smoke damage or smoke problem, you know, we may need to alter the burn plan to try to pick a, a specific wind direction. So one of the sites that we burn on an annual basis, uh, there's a lot of houses, there's an airport, there's all sorts of stuff in the way. So when we burn it, we in, in two of the units, uh, they're pretty big units, half sections, you know, we have to we have to pick southeast winds because we have to snake our smoke between two housing developments. And so every time there's a southeast wind, you know where I'm going to be burning it. So let's move into a little bit about the safety aspect, um, you know, beyond the smoke management safety. So I've talked a lot about spot fires today, and here's a good illustration, a picture of a spot fire. So the burn unit here is on the right side. Uh, their canyons uh, were full of cedar trees. It was a good south wind, humidity was really low. And so fi fire embers got up into the air and landed on the hillside across the road. And you could see there's you know one here, there's one here, one started here, then one here, one here. And there's also a couple more further down uh, that you can't really see from here. But, you know, the, the crew that was doing this, the Los Canyons Rangeland Alliance, you know, they, they knew that they were going to have potential spot fire issues. And so they wrote their burn plan to put people on these ridge tops to mitigate and stop these spot fires. So 
they understood it and they mitigated it, which is great. So when we talk about spot fires, uh, Oklahoma State did this really cool graph about what's the probability of ignition of a spot fire. So this graph isn't saying that, you know, between 20 and 24% humidity, there's a 100% chance that you're going to have a spot fire. What this is saying is if a ember um, gets, in the, gets into the air and goes over your fire line and lands in a receptive fuel bed while still ignited, there's nearly a 100% chance that that ember is going to start that receptive fuel bed on fire. So as you go, you know, further down, you know, 25 to 30%, that decreases by about half. And then when you get to about 40% humidity, there's a very low likelihood that an ember that lands in that receptive fuel bed would start that on fire. So like I said earlier, when we're burning, we're burning usually between 20 and 35% humidity. So there's always a really good possibility that a spot fire potentially could happen but we mitigate that through our putting in our black line or downwind line and doing our strip head firing before we ever light our ignition or, or head fire in our ring fire technique. So on the other hand, a slop over is a little bit different. So a spot fire is something that gets up into the atmosphere and goes over our line. A slop over is basically when the edge of the fire line just crosses our barrier, um, you know, whether like in this scenario here, um, they were supposed to be lighting out here in the middle of the fire break. They ended up igniting right along the edge of the, of the tall grass. And so what happened is that tall grass started on fire and then laid over and basically slopped over on that. And you can see that line here of where it went. So pretty important, uh, cow pies on the edge, yucca plants, logs, any kind of branches or anything like that right on the line could potentially cause those slop over fires. So it's always good to have a harrow uh, with you if you're burning, especially with cow pies and stuff like that. Um, but it's also beneficial if you maintain proper distance on your fire break when you're lighting your, your wet line, which is out, you know, at least two times the height of the fuel. So here's a good example of it. Uh, here's a really tall fuel. Here's the fire break. They're lighting, they're laying down the wet line right here, right off of the, in the middle of the fire break. And they're lighting the initial backing fire off the line here. And the reason why they're doing it here instead of the fence line or closer to the fence line is because you want room to make sure if it does slop over that you can catch it before it does get over that line. Now, if they decided to light closer, like right along this edge here, um, what would happen there is that that would fall over and it would cause a slop over. Oops. So what happens if we do have a spot fire or a slop over and, and we got to put it out? Well, this is where come, uh, learning how to fight fire comes in handy, right? So we spent most of the day talking about how do we light fire but now we got to talk about how we put it out and for safety reasons. So, so occasionally an escape will happen and it happens to all of us, but you know, we got to determine how we're going to fight it. So there's a few different determinants on, you know, how we're going to fight it on what we're going to do. So it kind of depends on the size of the spot, uh, size of the flame and the intensity determines how basically how you're going to fight a fire. So there's essentially two different techniques. There's what we call a direct attack. So this is basically what we're typically going to use is where we're going to go in and basically knock down that fire as it's moving. An indirect attack is basically, you know, where we go down to the next section and light a backing fire off of it and, you know, put in our black line like we normally do with a prescribed burn. Different workshop, fire department will probably be called before we even do that. So let's talk about different techniques. So there's the direct attack, single flank. So basically um, ignore all these people. There's usually not this many people here. But basically you pick the longest flank or the flank that might turn into a head fire if the wind switches uh, or their, their resources need to be able to protect. 
but basically you find a, uh, your anchor point, you know, close to where the ignition source happened. And you just start working up the flank of the fire, putting out the, the flank of that fire until you reach the head of the fire. And then you'll kind of go down the other side and, and put out that side. A couple different things. You always want to make sure you're fighting from the black, if at all possible. Um, sometimes you have to be a little bit careful when fighting from the black because things are still actively flaming. And so you want to be careful with your truck. Um, if at all possible, you know, you can, you can work from uh, the grass side, just be cautious that uh, uh, how you're working there. And then of course, you always want to follow it up with some kind of ATV or hand crew uh, after you use the pumper to put out this fire. Now, this is the pinch attack, which is basically the same thing as a single, except for you just have two crews working on it now. So you basically start in the same downwind uh, corner where the ignition source happened, and then you work your way up to the head of the fire. So you're typically going to use these two techniques on fire, uh, fire spot fires that are active and growing. Um, you know, so they've already been kind of established, kind of like if we go back to that slide here, you know, this one right here and this one right here would probably need that pinch attack or at least that single side um, head. So the other method that we use in direct attack is a head attack. And so this is mostly used when a spot fire or slop over is just forming or is in light fuels or is maybe potentially about to cross a threshold that we don't want, say a fence or a road or something like that and you wanna knock down the head of that flame. Now it's gonna depend because you might not be able to get to the, to the head of the fire to knock it down because it may be too intense. And so that's why typically, you know, in a wildland situation, you know, we're working from the flanks up to the head of the fire because as we put out those flanks, it actually decreases the intensity of that head fire. So in this case, you'd start at the head uh, knock it down and then work back down your flanks. And then also, you know, always make sure you follow it up with ATV or UTV or hand crew uh, to do that. So a couple tips on our spot fires, uh, get it while it is small, you know, get in there, be aggressive about it. Uh, make sure, make sure you get it knocked out. Uh, cease ignitions on your main fire if it is safe to do so. Stop ignitions and, and allocate your resources to getting these put out before moving on. Uh, be aggressive, but also stay safe. You know, that fire is not going to get put out any faster if you get into an accident on your way to put it out. Okay, so just be aggressive, but stay safe. If a spot fire um, gets out uh, and you need, you know, more water, you can reposition your water tenders. Um, you know, for that, have dedicated equipment and spotters if needed. Call 911 if you think containment is likely. So I would say, you know, 80 to 90% of the fires that we do, we don't have ever have any spot fires ever. Um, they're relatively rare compared to the amount of fires that we put on the land. So, you know, don't be too nervous about spot fires, but it's something that we want to just make sure that people are aware of and consider uh, when we're actively putting fire out in the ground. The other thing that you can do when we talk about the indirect attack method, you know, one thing that we do in our contingency plans when we write our contingency is what happens if a fire does get out? Do we have a backup plan? Um, you know, in this case here, you know, this is a ridge line and, you know, access road that we could potentially light a fire out, a backing fire off of and stop any fire that is moving Toward that direction. So these are different things, you know. Uh, different different plans require different things. You know, what kind of fuel is present? Are there any structures or livestock that need to be protected? Uh, what are our escape routes? Uh, things of that nature. All right, let's move into some uh, some other safety stuff. Like I said, this is. Um, some federal wildland firefighting type stuff, but it's pretty applicable to prescribed fire as well. And there's some basic, there's basic, basic tips on keeping yourself and the crew safe. So LACES stands for lookout, 
communication, escape route, and safety zones. And they say laces must be established and known to all firefighters before needed. So you're constantly thinking about these things as on every fire. It's just, it becomes second nature to you, uh, thinking about it in your mind. So L is for lookout. So crew members have the sole responsibility for watching trends in fire behavior, crew locations, uh, spotting or escape fires, any hazards to crew safety. Um, so everybody, you know, on a fire should always be looking out for what potentially could go wrong, right? So you're constantly looking, you know, one, two, three steps ahead saying, you know, what's going to happen next? And then communication. Communication is really important on a fire. Uh, one, I like to have uh, Everybody should have a radio or access to a radio uh, while in the field. Make sure they're charged and programmed to the correct channel. Uh, make sure everybody knows who that they're supposed to be communicating to is really important. Everybody should have an identified escape route. So wherever, whatever place you are on a prescribed fire, you should always be looking for like, okay, what happens if I need to get out of here? Where am I going to go? Is there a crop field or is there an already burned area? If you're sitting in fuel, you're also fuel. So you always want to make sure you know how to escape and get out of those situations. And the final part of LACE is safety zones. And these are the safety zones uh, where you're going to basically, you're going to use your escape route to get to these safety zones. And these could be that roadway, a fire break, black areas. So you want to be making sure that you're using your escape routes to get to these safety zones if something goes wrong. So as you're on the prescribed burn, you're always going to be looking out for that way out just in case something does happen. So another thing, um, NWCG, uh, federal firefighting thing that they put together, the standard firefighting orders and basically if you're a wildland firefighter for the feds, you basically are quizzed on this. Um, it's a good information to have, but it's organized. Uh, it's based off 16 fires uh, where people lost their lives tragically, um, where you know it basically the outcome of it was, okay, here's why this happened. And so knowing these on a prescribed fire are also pretty important. So they are keep informed of the fire conditions and forecast. And that's really simple. So that just means like, what, what do we know the fire is gonna be doing or what their weather is gonna be doing throughout the day? We know by three o'clock in the afternoon, humidity is gonna be dropping out, temperature is gonna be at the highest, right? So we know those things and we can keep an eye on, on those things. Know what your fire is doing at all times. So be um, aware of your surroundings of what that fire is doing. Is it behaving you know, unusual? Is it behaving as you expected? And then to be on top of that, you wanna make sure you base all your actions on current and expected fire behavior. And so I think this is kind of that big thing where you know, at nine o'clock in the morning, you know, your, your fire is gonna behave completely different than at three or four o'clock in the afternoon. So you wanna base all your actions now and in the future on that expected fire behavior. And then as we talked about in LACES, make sure you identify your escape routes continually and your safety zones and make them known to uh, other people around you. So let's say you're a crew boss on one side and you have an interior igniter. You know, if you say, hey, you know, if you need to get out of there, make sure you, you know, go over there um, to get into your safe zone. Post lookouts when there's possible danger. Again, we just talked about that when we were talking about spot fires, you know, they knew that there was possible danger there, so they posted a lookout. Be alert, keep calm, think clearly, act decisively. Uh, that's a good life lesson in general. Maintain prompt communications with your forces, your supervisor and adjoining forces. Uh, that basically just maintain communications with your crew boss and your burn boss and the people around you. Uh, it's just, you know, it's pretty basic. Give clear instructions and be sure that they are understood. All right, we talked about that as far as a, you know, good communication with burn boss and crew bosses. 
but with everybody. Maintain control of your forces at all time. Basically just maintain control of your crew if they're goofing around or not paying attention or you know, talking about Husker football or something like that. Uh, you wanna make sure that, um, that they're paying attention. And then fight fire aggressively, having provided for safety first. I mentioned that again, it's about, um, you know, fire is not gonna get put out if you get into a, a vehicle rollover or something. And then we have kind of more broadly, uh, these watch out situations. And so these situations are essentially, you wanna like, um, if you find yourself in this situation, it should be a, an alarm goes off in your head. And basically says, oh, I need to get myself out of this situation. So we'll briefly kind of go through these. So again, this goes back to what we talked about in the last, you know, safety zones are not identified. No escape routes. Um, if you show up to a burn and you have no idea on what the strategy is or what tactics you're using or what hazards are around, uh, you want to make sure, that, you know, that will be an alarm bell for me. If the instructions or assignments are not clear, that's a watch out situation. Again, that goes back to asking that question. Like, if you're not sure what you're supposed to be doing, ask somebody what you're supposed to be doing and make sure it's very clear. And then no communication link between supervisors or crew members. So if you can't get a hold of your burn boss or crew boss, that should be a watch out situation. Again, if there's any unburned fuel between you and the fire, you are also considered fuel. So um, have your or escape routes and identify zones, safety zones figured out. Um, weather becoming hotter and drier, we know what that happened. We know what that means, right? That means that fire behavior is going to increase. If the wind increases or changes directions, obviously that's a watch out situation. If you're getting lots of spot fires or slop over on the line, that could also be a big watch out situation. So to kind of summarize it up, safety is our number one concern and priority on almost every prescribed fire. It plays a role in every um, stage of it. So from the design to prep to execution and to mop up to the evaluation of the burn. Many times after a burn, we'll get together and talk about what things went good and what things could have gone better. So the next time we burn, we're even better. So it's basically just about, you know, being effective in your communication to maintain that safe fire operation. Are there any questions?